Uh, so when I was nine years old, my mom bought me a, a T-square. And I wish I could say this was the glorious beginning of my architecture career, but it actually wasn't, because the first thing I did with it was attach a couple rubber bands to the black parts, I turned it into a crossbow, and I shot frozen lima beans at my brother. Uh, the second thing I did with it was design, but it wasn't architecture. I had a brief stint as a nine-year-old as an automotive designer. And this is, believe it or not, a stretch limo pickup truck. And you can see the handlebars of my bike sticking out of the back. Um, and I show this just to start to introduce a, a, a conversation about interdisciplinary thinking. So I was using an architectural tool to design an automotive product, shifting between disciplines. Probably not the most glorious example, but we'll see, we'll get to that a little bit more um, later. Most of us probably know a little bit about architecture. We know it's historically divided into styles, and I'm often asked what style are we in or what's coming in the future. I actually believe this is an old model, and I think our future for architecture probably looks a little bit more like this. Many styles, in fact, maybe thousands of styles. And what's enabling this new type of architecture is incredible advances in computation, material sciences, ways of fabricating things, ways of collaborating, and ways of communicating. And what I do in my office is I tend to work between disciplines, uh, work with different software packages. I believe software is helping us to break down boundaries between creative disciplines. And this gives people from many different industries all sorts of different tools. So I use tools from the automotive industries, from Hollywood industry, uh, special effects industries, from industrial design. And likewise, some of these people are starting to use my tools. And that's what makes this type of matrix of thousands of styles possible. There's simply so much stuff that we can start to uh, experiment with now. Um, what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is just show you a handful of projects from my office and from my teaching at Yale that are just testing ideas. None of these are manifestos about how the future must be, but instead they're just proposed as what-if uh, kind of scenarios. For instance, what if robots could help us to build and control spaces? I was hired to do a store for a fashion designer who was also the creative director for Lady Gaga, and we had to do this really incredible store. We tried, decided to do uh, like a faceted gem interior. And to do it, we needed a little help carving out all these very specific pieces. So we used uh, this robotic arm to help carry out um, the construction process. So some of the students at Yale actually did this video of the arm dancing. I thought it would be, this is it dancing to Diana Ross, actually. Uh, I thought it'd be more interesting than showing you a still image. But we used this device to cut out and figure out how to combine hundreds of facets and thousands of connectors to create this kaleidoscopic interior space where Lady Gaga's outfits were all on display. And then we also used robotic light fixtures that had uh, different lenses and colors on them so we could actually focus the light on the ceiling in different places to get it to reflect on different outfits and different products that were for sale. Or what if architecture wasn't based on geometry, but was based on genetic code? We typically think of architecture as squares and circles and triangles, but what if we looked at little more intricate ways to think about architecture like cells? So my office took something as simple as a brick wall and thought about if every brick is just a little bit different and we're 3D printing them or robotically manufacturing them, then we can start to see emergent patterns. And just tweaking the digital code a little bit allows for a completely different result. And we're using that in some of our real projects. For instance, this is a performing arts uh, practice facility for Bard College, north of New York. And in the interior, we're doing these interlocking wooden bricks to create a cascading, almost like a waterfall of pixelated wooden bricks that's all top lit. And this is for one of the uh, collaborative rehearsal spaces. What would it be like to physically occupy the cloud? I mean, we hear a lot about the cloud. We hear it may be one of the most significant advances in human history. Uh, but no one knows what it looked like. I mean, gods get temples and corporations get skyscrapers, but what does the poor cloud get? So we were hired by a technology company to do a project where we're trying to manifest a, an environment on what it would like to be in the cloud. So we're looking at curved glasses because glass gets stronger when you curve it, which allows us to eliminate the structure. We're using translucent LCD screens, so when you turn them off, you can see through the whole structure, and when you turn it on, you would get something that looks like this. So when you walk through this lobby, imagine you all look at your computer, or if you're a big nerd, you have six computer screens in front of you. I'm sure there's a couple of you out there in this audience, but you may look at a YouTube video, but imagine seeing 
300 YouTube videos as you walk through this lobby on your way to work, just kind of peripherally learning what's going on in the world live and in a totally immersive atmosphere. What if architecture actually started to move? Um, I've been fascinated with robotics and their movement in helping me make things in my office, but I decided to actually think what would happen if we used them in an actual project. So for one of our fashion clients, we're kind of tricking out these robotic arms, glossy paint and chrome, uh, and an architecture firm choreographing robotic movement that allows us to change the screens, LCD screens on them, to kind of partition off different parts of the store, or in this image, show how you can have different formats of information come together in different ways uh, as kind of a spectacle within the environment itself. So you can move from vertical images, the things can fold back and become uh, movie files. And this is just such a movie file. I feel like I'm on Jeopardy, and you know, you see those people like clicking really hard and they, they never get the answer. They look at Alex Trebek like there's something wrong. Uh, what if architectural intelligence wasn't only about buildings? When we were doing these stores for Lady Gaga, we were involved in designing an outfit for one of the openings that she would wear. And our original idea was to have her wear a kind of terrarium with plants in it. Uh, over the course of a couple months, that migrated and it was decided that she would wear her own faces. So we worked with a fashion designer with the Mudbox division of Autodesk to sculpt these faces of Lady Gaga and 3D printed them. So this is them emerging from a 3D powder printer. Uh, and then she wore this with a kind of membrane that shot out of the neck and flew down her body and turned into some insect wings uh, that, where she uh, ascended to heaven. <laughs> you hire an architect, you go straight to heaven. <laughs> Keep that in mind. What if architecture recycled not only physical materials, but virtual ones? Now, we hear a lot about architects recycling things like wood and metal, but my office took a kind of tongue-in-cheek approach to that and said, what if we stopped designing everything from scratch and just started downloading 3D models that everyone else had already used? These poor 3D models sitting in people's hard drives, forgotten, never to be used again. Well, we started downloading random things like Tyrannosaurus rexes and anchors and cameras and file cabinets, Mickey Mouses. And we started combining them into this new language of architectural form because if you're making things robotically, you can make things with an unlimited amount of detail and it's the same price as doing something flat, more or less. Uh, so these are some of those early experiments combining randomly uh, 3D models from around the world. And we started playing with that and we actually used this language to design our uh, um, Guggenheim Museum in Helsinki, our entry for that competition. So here you can see this almost the entire building is constructed of ornamental surfaces. This whole thing was made in a couple of days. Um, and you can see in the cross section here that some of that ornament trickles into the ear interior, creating what's almost like a giant uh, occupiable sculpture on the edge of Helsinki. With some of my... Uh, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, with some of my students at Yale, uh, we've been working with a couple different companies. One is actually, and I didn't know this was going to be the case, with the Fusion software, which is a collaborative design software. So all of the students were able to import different 3D models, and they could delete each other's models. If you didn't like someone's Tyrannosaurus Rex, you could delete it and replace it with a toaster. Uh, what they did was they created this object, this occupiable volume, which is actually a 3D print that's about four feet tall. So this was a test to see what kind of detail we could get. You can see one of the minions from Despicable Me here off to the side. It has hippopotamuses and Pegasus and Super Mario Brothers and trumpets and file cabinets and fully clothed ladies. And, uh, and then we wanted to push it one step further. How would you make this in real life? It's not enough to 3D print a building. What if we wanted to do a solid marble building? I mean, this design is so great. It deserves to be in solid marble, right? So. My students uh, trained a th robotic arm in Tuscany to uh, carve this out of a solid block of marble. So this is a solid block of marble about this big. Uh, so this is recycled virtual materials done in collaborative design software by 12 students carved with a robot in the hills of Tuscany with the same marble that Michelangelo used for his sculptures. Uh, the last project I'm going to show is uh, my office started using automotive design software to think what would happen if architecture appropriated the intelligence of automotive design. So this building is for the Estonian Academy of the Arts in Tallinn, Estonia, 
and it was designed as, with the same logic as surfaces that you would use to design a car. They're called Class A surfaces. And as you can see in the building, it has scoops and vents, but instead of cooling down an engine, they're used to channel wind and air, fresh air, to different parts on the interior of a building. Now, the first image I showed was uh, me using uh, architectural tools to design a car. And the last project I showed you was me using automotive design tools to design architecture. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. And if you've learned nothing today, I hope that we can at least all agree that at the very least, I've managed to hit the theme, which is, of course, back to the future. Thank you.